Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to AER Live, a series of online interactive workshops from Applied Ecology Resources. My name is Professor Holly Jones, lead editor for AER's open access journal, Ecological Solutions and Evidence. And I'm delighted you have all joined today for this much anticipated workshop. We'd like to first thank today's sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics, for the relaxing nature scape you've heard as you waited for the workshop to begin. Wildlife Acoustics is the leading provider of bioacoustics monitoring technology for biologists, researchers, and government agencies worldwide. You can learn more about their product offerings and application, applications at wildlifeacoustics.com. This month's AER Spotlight on, is on Nature Scott's report, Development of the Mountain Hare National Monitoring Scheme, tra Trialing a Citizen Science Approach. This report by the Scottish, Gov Scottish government's nature agency details how they collaborated with multiple NGOs to test methods that recruited citizen scientists to collect the distribution and occurrence data for mountain hares, a near threatened species on the UK red list of mammal species. Results from the pilot this year has already, have already confirmed that a citizen science approach can contribute to more robust understandings of the species conservation status by improving monitoring efficiency and coverage. Reporting on such studies are vital for facilitating evidence-based decision-making, especially when it comes to embarking on new projects that have the potential to improve efficiency amidst limited resources. It's one of the main reasons why Nature Scott has joined AER as a long-term member, and you can visit appliedecologyresources.com forward slash membership to find out more about what an AER membership can do for you and your organization. <clears throat> I'll shortly hand over to our speaker for today's workshop, but before I do, please note a few housekeeping rules. The workshop will be recorded and posted online, so please keep your camera and audio off at all times unless asked otherwise. Please send in any questions or comments to, for the speaker via Zoom in the chat, and we will share these during the Q&A section of the workshop. The AER team is also on hand to address any technical issues if you share them via the chat. Without waiting any longer, let me introduce Dr. Elizabeth Bach for her workshop, Building a Community of Restoration Practice and Science at Natchusa Grasslands. Over to you, Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much, Holly. Um, and thank you to AER and the British Ecological Society for inviting me uh, to present this workshop. And thank you all uh, for attending uh, virtually. I'm really delighted to spend the next hour with you. Um, I am joining you all today from uh, my workplace, uh, the Natusa Grasslands Preserve in the United States in the state of Illinois. This is the ancestral homelands of the Peoria, Meskwaki, Sauk, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi nations and tribes. Um, these people have uh, shaped the landscape uh, that I get to call home uh, for millennia, and uh, their current uh, populations are still an important part of this landscape, and we're honored to humbly uh, work towards building relationship and healing um, in this process. I also want to acknowledge the Nature Conservancy in Illinois, my employer. Um, the Nature Conservancy is a global nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting nature around the world. Uh, they own and manage uh, Nechisa Grasslands Preserve and um, pay for my time as well as my colleagues, uh, Project Director Bill Kleiman, Deputy Director Cody Considine, our Land Steward Phil Nagorny, and Crew Manager Molly Duncan. I also want to acknowledge uh, two of our wonderful colleagues, Dee Hudson and Charles Larry, both of whom are phenomenal photographers, and you're going to see many of their images um, in this talk today. So I'd like to begin uh, with a poll uh, to get you all excited about this uh, topic. I'm going to launch a poll question uh, that's going to ask you about your favorite analogy for working between science and land management practice. Uh, all right, 
So uh, hopefully the poll questions have popped up on your screen. Um, please take a moment and choose your favorite analogy for doing science with management goals. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll and share the results with you all. Uh, so favorite analogy for doing science with management goals, about a third of you, uh, landed with a bridge, uh, our traditional analogy. Um, a few votes also for the handshake and an overwhelming uh, response for an orchestra. So this is awesome. Um, I love uh, kind of exploring these different ways to think about our work um, a little bit of an abstract way to help us see the big picture. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll now and uh, talk a little bit about an analogy I've recently been playing with to think about my work with science and management. The bridge is perhaps the most common analogy that we often hear about in our community, connecting two sides of, of kind of thinking or approach to doing our work. I would like to propose the seesaw, the uh, playground seesaw or teeter-totter as an alternative analogy for this work. Unlike a bridge, seesaws are dynamic. They move up and down. And sometimes uh, we're sitting perfectly balanced, eye to eye, in agreement. But where a seesaw gets to be most fun is when there's a little bit of an up and down, a push and a pull. And this is actually a really healthy thing for a working relationship as well as we begin to think about uh, bridging or uh, kind of teeter tottering between science and management. Sometimes a land manager will push up, bringing important questions uh, to the forefront of the discussion that, if answered, could help make better management decisions or uh, guide uh, uh, um, decisions around things like a troublesome invasive species. Sometimes the scientist pushes up, um, bringing a specific set of requirements or requests to conduct a detailed controlled experiment with long-term monitoring and tightly controlled treatments. This give and take is not really a problem. In fact, it's really important to come into conversations with land managers and scientists to uh, honestly about the needs that you and your partners have. Um, if either party isn't honest about what those deal breakers are, it's only going to lead to frustration in a sense that the other party just doesn't understand. It's equally important to think about where you can let go of some control. Maybe it's unreasonable to ask for a, uh, or a, a um, randomized complete block design with a control where an invasive species in a sensitive habitat isn't controlled. Um, maybe there's another approach that could be used to ask that question, like a before after control impact design. Uh, similarly, land managers uh, can be really open-minded about accommodating some of the those needs from scientists. Uh, for example, being aware of plot placement and instrumentation that might need to be left in the field for a period of time. One of my favorite stories here at Nechusa uh, is, is shown here in this picture. Uh, this is one of our long-term plant monitoring transects, which you're going to hear about in the second half of this talk. Um, this is an example where I needed to collect that data from a particular spot. Uh, but our land manager, Phil, needed to control an invasive species by mowing it a little further out in the field, as you can see. Uh, Phil was able to drive his tractor out into the field, do the management that needed to get done, and my quadrat landed exactly between those tire tracks. Um, I got the data I needed, he got the management done that the preserve needed. As scientists, it's also good to think about um, how parts of the ecosystem can naturally make disturbances. In these photos, can you tell which of these photos is the result of bison grazing and which of them is the result of um, mowing from a tractor for invasive species? If wildlife disturbances are par for the course, perhaps management disturbances can also be accepted. This relationship is not just about accommodation. The push and pull of different perspectives um, is really healthy to building knowledge. It helps both partners learn and grow professionally. For example, many land managers have extensive natural history knowledge and can bring a lot of information about uh, phenology, uh, species identification, and interactions just because of how much time they spend in the field. 
researchers can bring a wider expertise from other ecosystems to bear on local challenges. Um, an example of this, I've recently connected with colleagues at the Nature Conservancy working to restore seagrass off the east coast of uh, the United States. They're collecting seed with wetsuits and snorkels and planting it from boats. At Nechusa, we're collecting seed with scissors and buckets and planting it from trucks. It turns out we had a lot of common ground, even though we were working in radically different systems. With a seesaw, getting on and off is the trickiest part. Uh, just like getting started and sometimes ending a working relationship can be really tricky. Building trust that the other person will hold still while you get on or off the seesaw is critical. Uh, research scientists often have a steep learning curve to learn how a preserve operates and what the expectations for those managers are. In contrast, land managers often have a lot to learn about specific scientific vocabulary and the demands on an academic uh, scientist such as a professor. Sometimes one partner leaves, causing the other to drop rapidly to the ground. Perhaps a graduate student graduates, graduates but doesn't publish the paper or uh, share the data with the, uh, with the field site. Perhaps the land manager moves on to another job and doesn't transfer that relationship or knowledge to the new hire, or perhaps the agency doesn't even replace that person. It's important to think about and discuss these contingencies early on in this process. However, once trust is there, a seesaw can be a really joyous experience. The dynamic learning and co-research can lead to exciting new insights and growth for both parties um, and change the field of ecology and on the ground conservation and restoration management. And it turns out seesaws are not just for two people. Uh, with fundamental trust, building large collaborations can increase learning and the fun in doing this kind of science and uh, management conservation work on the ground. So with that, I'd like to take a moment and um, bring you all into this conversation a little bit. I have a few questions here, um, and I'd love it if you feel comfortable to share some insight in the chat, if you're willing to type in your responses to the chat. And my question is, um, have you ever felt like you were on a seesaw with colleagues in research and practice? Uh, are there examples where that was fun or joyous? And um, if you're comfortable, are there examples where it wasn't? Um, and of course, feel free to anonymize. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, um, but I'd love to hear what some of other people's experiences are out there. Great, so we have a response here, how the results are exciting, uh, but it can be really frustrating how much energy is required for sure. For sure. And it can feel that trust building can feel like you're not getting a lot done uh, for a long period of time. I certainly hear that. Yeah, so here we've got a great uh, response. It can be challenged to deal with, uh, with a manager um, dealing with practicalities that Academics see as clear ecological answers, but don't have to deal with the complexity of delivery. So yeah, actually taking some of those insights and realizing it can be really hard uh, to enact those on the ground. Um, an example I'm thinking of from my work is uh, certain uh, requests from, from scientists about how to manage prescribed fire to benefit one particular species. Um, that can be really helpful insight, but it sometimes doesn't take into account the logistics of uh, setting up our fire gear, getting our crews trained and ready to go. We can't always uh, do a change the seasonality of our fire very easily because of that. Um, I have another comment here. Um, Sometimes there's a lot of argument and conflict, uh, but we learn uh, new ideas from each other in this way. So yeah, being um, open to hearing those different sides and realizing that, yeah, it's not always gonna be pretty and not everybody's not always gonna be happy all the time, 100% um, true. Uh, yeah, and I'm hearing this again, um, the outcome can be great. It can take a lot of time to build that trust and, and really get it up and going. And yeah, people coming to the table with different priorities. Um, our employers will have different priorities, a governmental agency, a nonprofit, an academic. Um, and so our expectations of what we're taking away from a project can be really different. Um, and that's where kind of powering through those discussions early on can be really helpful. And there isn't always going to be a win-win, um, kind of why I keep toying with the seesaws that, that sometimes it comes around um, really great and sometimes uh, you know, there are some compromises.
Yeah, so here's a great example where some work um, kind of went through a building phase, um, was set to the side and came back later on and was stronger in that later phase because of that. So that's wonderful to hear. Um, and we'll kind of look at this one, la a couple other things here. Uh, yeah, hearing what questions are and um, having, you know, engaging graduate students with their own curiosity to pursue those. So having kind of some other uh, opinions on that. And uh, yeah, and a joy. So we'll end on this joy. Deep knowledge managers have from learned experiences are exciting to share. The key challenge is uh, managers knowing so much about specifics, um, which can lead to a lot more caveats in scientific research. It, it means we know enough to, to know how it may not be applied at a broad scale. So anyway, well, thank you all for sharing. If you have other ideas you wanna pop in the chat, please feel free to. Um, I'm gonna kind of transition to the next side of this talk, um, but we can please come back to this during the question and answer. Um, I really uh, value hearing from you and your experiences and, and also realizing some of those frustrations are not mine alone, and some of those joys are not mine alone as well. Um, so at Nichusa Grasslands, the preserve where I work, we're building, we're working to build a community of restoration practice and science. Um, and this is a give and take of bringing a lot of people to the table to push our work forward um, and bring about this process. So here's an image of, of a typical busy day in the summer at Nichusa. You can see in this picture, we have scientists doing research. We have volunteers getting ready to go out to do management on the ground. Our staff is buzzing around. Um, this is an exciting amount of energy, and it's also a lot of people and a lot of priorities uh, coming to the project. So as I mentioned, the Nutritia Grasslands Preserve is located in the United States. We're in the northern part of the state of Illinois. Um, so I put a pin in this map here to kind of give everyone some context. We're in what's um, really ecologically the tall grass prairie region. Um, and the Nachusa Grasslands Preserve began in the mid 1980s. Um, the Nature Conservancy purchased about 400 acres, including some uh, unplowed native prairie hilltops, which there's very few of left in the state of Illinois. Um, in addition, there was some adjacent agricultural land, and the vision was to restore the area around these native prairie hilltops uh, to kind of expand that habitat footprint. And over the past 36 some odd years, the vision of this um, project has expanded. Um, it's now encompasses 4,000 acres, most of which is replanted or reconstructed tall grass prairie, um, where seeds been collected from these native prairie hilltops and planted into these agricultural fields. The preserve is home to over 700 native plant species, 250 bird species, 270 bee species, and a herd of 100 bison reintroduced in 2014. Because this project has always been a restoration project, um, and it was started in an era when we were still not certain that we could replant prairie and, and have a positive outcome, um, project director and my boss, uh, Bill Kleiman, worked with some consulting um, botanists to do some plant monitoring, set up some uh, transects that would be visited repeatedly over the years to look at how the plant community responded to um, management on native prairies, things like prescribed fire and invasive species control, how plantings of new prairies would respond over time, um, and additional work on the preserve. I uh, had the good fortune to join the staff at uh, Nichusa Grasslands in 2018, about five years ago, and this data set was definitely the low-hanging fruit I wanted to really dive into and tackle up front. Um, and I was a little bit fortuitous to find 12 of these transects that had been uh, visited three or more times between 1994 and 2016. And even more fortuitously, uh, four of these transects were located on native prairie hilltops. Four of these were located in what we call savanna areas with a little more tree cover. Um, and four of these were in planted uh, prairies that were formerly agricultural fields. So a nice balanced design in this case. All of these areas uh, received regular prescribed fire um, 
fire, these, these, this tall grass prairie system co-evolved with regular fire. Indigenous people uh, used fire to manage the landscape uh, for their use and for, for wildlife. Uh, we've also, particularly in these savanna areas, uh, which today tend to be heavily overgrown with uh, brush uh, in our part of the world, that tends to be things like honeysuckle, um, autumn olive, uh, Siberian elm, those sorts of things. Uh, so we'll remove that understory and do some overseeding to try and bring back that herbaceous understory that characterizes these habitats. And then also represented here are plantings into agricultural fields. Uh, typically, we'll wait for the corn harvest to happen in October. Um, we're starting to get ready for that in our part of the world. Um, and then plant uh, seed that uh, our crew has been hand collecting all summer. They're out right now picking seed for the 2023 planting um, and plant directly into these agricultural fields. And the planted prairies get the regular prescribed fire as well. I am going to know all of the data I'm talking about today predates the bison reintroduction at Nechusa, so I'm not going to dive into that. Um, but there are certainly, um, I'd be happy to talk about that, and there's other resources online and publications and journals like Ecological Solutions and Evidence with more information about that part of the project. I also wanted to um, introduce one metric here. Um, some of you on the call may be familiar with the coefficient of conservatism. Others uh, may not have heard of this at all, and that's totally fine. Um, the coefficient of conservatism is a value, a numeric value that experts in a certain region assign, in this case, to plant species. And it reflects the affinity that plant species has for um, undisturbed or unaltered habitats. So the higher uh, your C value or your coefficient of conservatism is, um, that ends up often being a more rare plant in our part of the world because we have very little unaltered habitat. Um, you only find it in these, these very special places that haven't been plowed up, that haven't been developed. Um, and, val and plant species with lower C values are a little more ubiquitous. They can survive some disturbance. They tend to be found more ubiquitously on the landscape. So for all practical purposes uh, today, we're looking at this as a metric of rarity. Um, and thinking about recruiting those rare plants that this habitat restoration process is in part geared towards. So we approach this work with two key questions. The first being, are management practices sustaining plant diversity, including rare plants and native prairies and savannas where we've uh, been doing active management over the past 30 some odd years? And secondly, do restored prairies support comparable levels of plant diversity and conservatism to these native prairies? So I'd like to show you this data, and this is published in Ecological uh, Solutions and Evidence. We can share that uh, link with you during the Q&A time. Um, so for starters, this is just looking at those native prairie habitats. The native prairies, savannas, and planted prairies all were, were fairly distinct, so it's, it's helpful to walk through each of these habitat types one at a time. Uh, this is a non-metric multidimensional scaling approach, so it's just an ordination to visualize how similar to communities are. Dots that are closer to each other are more similar in community type than dots that are further apart. And I've color coded these dots by the actual transect or the site, so you can see there's four independent uh, replications across the preserve. Uh, these are four different hilltops. They're not adjacent to each other. Um, they are considered distinct units um, in our management work. And the hue of these dots, the, the how bold the color is, uh, represents the year. So the bolder color are the oldest samplings from 1994. The lightest colors are the most recent samplings from the mid 20 teens. And what you can see is that all four of these native prairie um, transects are actually fairly distinct from each other. They all have a somewhat unique plant community. Um, and this is really cool when we think about protecting and conserving these sites. There's not one size fits all in what these uh, native prairies look like. They look quite different from each other. And we can also see that these plant communities are changing over time as uh, management has moved forward. And if we dig in to look at what those changes might be, uh, we can see um, an increase in total plant species for one of these transects, um, but relatively no change in the proportion of native species. And you can see in some of these transects, the proportion of native species is nearly 100%. So actually, no change is a good thing. <laughs> um, 
in the last uh, row, we're looking at that mean coefficient of conservatism, that mean C value. And again, this is a measure of plant rarity. We did see an increase in one of these transects of that plant rarity. Most importantly, I want to note that we didn't see a decrease in plant rarity in any of these transects. Um, so our native prairies are maintained maintaining the plant species communities that were there when they were originally uh, protected. Looking at the savanna habitats, this is a similar story. Each of these four different savanna uh, areas are somewhat distinct from each other. They're less distinct than the native prairies. Um, and those communities are definitely changing over time, as you can see from the hue of those colors. However, when we dig into uh, metrics like total plant species, proportion of native plant species, and this coefficient of conservatism, we saw no change, no statistical change over time in these savannas. Um, However, for those of us working on the preserve, we know that these uh, savanna areas, in fact, look very different than they did when we started this work um, represented by these photos here. So I dug in a little deeper and ran some indicator species analyses to get a sense of what's going on under the hood here. And what I found was that um, kind of invasive woody species like honeysuckle Virgi or Virginia creeper, which is native, but, but abundant, um, and poison ivy, also native, but abundant, overly abundant, uh, really distinguished these savanna communities in the early years before we started removing understory brush and, and reinstating prescribed fire. In the most recent samplings of the same areas, the plants, the indicator plants were really native goldenrod, sedges, and joe pieweed. So we were actually structurally seeing a flip from a uh, woody brush dominated understory into an open herbaceous dominated understory. And while that didn't change anything like total plant richness or the proportion of native plants, um, this is a major structural shift for this habitat and exactly what we were going for in these management inter interventions. And finally, the planted prairies. Um, so here I had to use three dimensions to encapsulate these relationships. So you're just looking at a three-dimensional cube from a couple different perspectives. So down, side, forward. Um, and this is just giving you a few different views of what's going on here. Uh, you can see again, some distinction between these different sites um, definitely change over time. That's uh, definitely the big story here. And when we dig in, uh, we don't necessarily see much of a change in total plant species, um, but we did see an increase in the proportion of native species in the oldest planting on the site, the 1987 planting, and an increase in this mean C value or plant rarity in the oldest two plantings, the 87 and 88 plantings. Now, when we set these planted prairies next to the native prairies in the same ordination, again, um, I had to use three dimensions to visualize this. The warm colors, the yellows and reds, are the native prairies, these hilltop prairies. The cool colors, the blues, are the planted prairies. And you can see that they're fairly distinct from each other. Um, they are looking quite different. And when we look at these kind of broad measures of plant uh, abundant or richness, diversity, and rarity, uh, we see that the native prairies do maintain a higher proportion of native plant species and higher mean C than these planted prairies. So to answer our questions, are management practices sustaining plant diversity, including rare plants and native prairies and savannas? Yes, um, we are seeing that. Do restored prairies support comparable levels of plant diversity and conservatism to native prairies? Well, not quite. So this is uh, really brings forward the important um, the importance of protecting native prairies where they exist. In our part of the world, there's very few of them, and so each of them is precious. Um, but it also leads to some follow-up questions, as, as scientists always love, which includes something I'm hoping to take a look at in the next couple of years, how our planting practices, which have evolved quite a bit over the past 35 years, to include some of our newer plantings and take a look at some of the differences between older and newer plantings and how our management and planting approaches have, have changed um, and how that looks from a plant diversity and community perspective. Um, it's also really exciting to think about how each of these plantings is now woven together to create a 4,000 acre landscape level area of habitat. And this has certainly had major implications for birds, reptiles, and mammals, um, as mentioned by those species numbers I talked about at the beginning of this section. So at Nechusa Grasslands, um, the work continues 
continues. Uh, we continue planting new prairies every year. As I mentioned, our crew's getting ready for our 2023 planting to go in the ground in a few weeks. Uh, we are seeing increased biodiversity, um, not only plants, but uh, from insects and uh, reptiles and mammals and um, all sorts of other organisms. Uh, we're also working hard to share the science through webinars like this and publications coming from researchers that we've engaged from numerous different institutions. This is an area our project has really grown in a lot in the past uh, five to eight years, and it's been a really um, exciting thing for our management staff as well to learn and to be able to have a place to voice those questions that, that really they struggle with every day. And our big overarching goal is to inspire conservation action, not just at Nechusa, not just across northern Illinois and the Midwest of, of North America, but across grasslands and ecosystems around the world. So I'm going to wrap up with one more poll question uh, before I take questions. And that is, where do you find joy in collaboration? Um, so let me relaunch this poll. All right, hopefully you're all seeing that. We'll give everyone a few minutes. This one, you can select all that applies. So you don't have to make one choice. You can, you can look at all of them. Um, and uh, as responses come in, I'll, I'll share the results and then we'll dive into discussion and questions. Awesome, that was excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth. See, we're getting some good answers here in the poll. Yeah. Just a reminder to everyone, feel free to put questions into the chat once you're done identifying all the joys of collaboration. <laughs> and answers that aren't listed here are welcome in the chat too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. All right, I can end the poll. Looks like we're kind of getting done and share the results with you all. So looks like kind of a nice even split and it looks like a lot of people liked multiple answers. Uh, shared passion for a common goal was really the big winner. And I think that's certainly invigorating thing in my work as well. Um, yeah. All right, we, um, I wanted to point out um, a comment that was an answer to one of the earlier questions in the chat here. Um, I'm not sure, Elizabeth, if you can see the chat or if you want me to read it to you. Um, I'd be I happy can. to read it to you. Why don't you read it to me so that I okay. scroll through? Cool. Then everyone can hear it. For people from different cultural backgrounds, the view on the same topic could be different. Um, in some, in old time Christian ideology, the definition for wildness refers to something that should be explored by civilization. Then there is a modern argument about if pristine necessarily means completely untouched by human for nature. But from traditional Chinese culture and maybe also indigenous people in America, humanity is suggested to coexist with nature. Then engineering nature um, through humanity does not necessarily have conflict with pristine nature from such a viewpoint. I thought that was a cool comment. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and then we do have some questions in here. If what you get back to is not quite native, will there be some stakeholders who do not see that as quote unquote success? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and yes, I think that's, um, you know, part of that seesaw too, is that the expectations of your, you know, the colleagues, the people who are invested in the site can be a little bit different. And there, there are some people who will, feel that it needs to be 100% um, native cover or it needs to have a particular mean coefficient of conservatism. And I think that's part of kind of living in community. I tend to take this approach of, of trying to be open and, and listen and hear where people are coming from and what their expectations are, um, but also uh, trying to guide these conversations so that we can recognize that there's there's a multitude of expectations out there and that there isn't one version of success. And in fact, um, what the Nature Conservancy or Nechisa Grasslands consider success may not be what the Illinois Department of Natural Resources considers success. It may not be what um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service considers success. It may not be what, um, you know, a, um, you know, a different uh, nation, a European nation, um, and uh, Chinese might consider success as well. And I think 
With restoration, the trick is that success metric often lands with who's um, doing the restoration and how they set that up. Um, so yeah, I guess part of that is managing expectations of what success means. And I think it also means leaving room for growth around what success means. I think what we would call success today is very different from what um, many people thought of success 30 years ago. And I think that that echoes back to that wonderful comment too about including more perspectives and, and learning more deeply about other um, uh, ways that humanity and nature interact and in fact are, are related uh, to each other. I hope that got to the right right vein there. Yeah, thank you. Um, this next question is a fun one. How important is the community of practice to achieving success at Natchusa? And how important is it to how the Nature Conservancy approaches its work? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, this is definitely the heart of what I wanted to to try and talk about in this in this presentation today, which is Natusa grasslands would not be the preserve it is today without that community. Um, and as I'll try and keep this brief, but an example of that is is in the early '90s when the project started. This was always a project that that some of our local folks who were very conservation minded in in our local community convinced the Nature Conservancy to come out here and invest in this landscape. And so we've always had this very strong volunteer culture. And in fact, um, the first full time staff didn't come on board until until 1993 when when my boss was hired. Um, and my boss has really done a lot to foster a community of, of volunteer stewards who are doing plantings, who are doing invasive species management. And in fact, um, we'll actually kind of let them have a unit that that they're going to plan the planting and, and do all the work. And it creates this great sense of, of investment in the project. But because we had different volunteers trying different things on the landscape, we all got to learn um, kind of simultaneously. And it was because we had volunteers who were like, I'm going to collect three times more seed than than your staff is, and I'm going to put it in a smaller area, and I'm going to do way more diversity. And it was because we had these invested <laughs> volunteers who were willing to take the time and try these different things that we learned. Um, and as a result, the plantings that we do now, um, they, you know, in the early days, we were planting maybe 10 pounds per acre of native plant seed and maybe 60 different species. Today, we're planting 50 to 60 pounds per acre of seed and 150 different species. And that's because there was a community of people trying. Um, we don't have enough staff to try all of those options out together. Um, and I know I'm prattling here a little, but the other really key strength about the community angle here is that um, it creates a landscape that's a little bit heterogeneous. We have um, these volunteer plantings that are a little different from these larger scale crew plantings. And um, we have areas where a certain volunteer has been like, I want to plant to really target bobolink birds or the particular kind of animal interaction or a particular insect interaction. And because of that, we have spaces across this landscape that support those things. And it's not a homogenous landscape. Now, the second part of that question is how does this um, important to how the Nature Conservancy approaches this work. And this is something that we uh, certainly work and um, collaborate with our colleagues across the Nature Conservancy. I would say that it is not necessarily a ubiquitous approach to restoration and conservation in the Nature Conservancy, but it's one where, again, uh, because the Nature Conservancy is this global network of preserves, we can all learn from each other. I mentioned that connection with the um, Virginia Coast Reserve that I've recently made. Um, our, we're trying to be colleagues and, and part of that broader community and, and share this work as well. So I hope that answered that question. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, let me see. There's a couple more in the chat. Um, we'll go with a pretty quick one and then a follow-up that might be a little bit longer. The first is just were the areas for mowing or grazing defined by like fencing and how did you decide? And then was there invasion by woody species into prairies, which signals need for adaptive management or adjustment to mowing and brush removal? Yeah, so great question. Um, and there's there's kind of a couple ways to think about this. So uh, the first is as 
the Nature Conservancy has had the opportunity to acquire land and this project has expanded. Um, there often were fences around those different tracks and, and in a lot of cases we go in and take those fences out and open that up into a connected landscape. Um, there's also that also relates to history and how some of those lands uh, were used prior to the Nature Conservancy owning it. So we have a lot of our savanna areas um, had more trees. They were probably historically used for grazing or hunting or even some some wood cutting. Um, and so the way we, you know, approach management in those areas can be a little bit different from an open cornfield um, where we're just going to go in and plant. Um, in terms of invasive species, kind of in our day-to-day -day work, we'll pay attention to where it is. We do a lot of um, mapping of those invasive species on, with ArcGIS on our phones. Uh, we all have the Field Maps app, and we can be in the field and we're like, oh, here's an invasive species, or here's a giant patch of an invasive species, and we can automatically um, communicate to our colleague Phil who might be on a tractor. I'm like, oh, I've got a huge swath of sweet clover out here. Can you bring the tractor out later this week and mow it? And that'll be, he'll just mow the area where that invasive species is an issue. We don't mow the whole planting, just where that invasive species is an issue. Um, in terms of woody species, prescribed fire is the best way for us to control woody species. And we burn our units very frequently. Um, are especially the more savanna areas they get annual fire and that's not um i guess that's in range with our goals around maintaining a native dominated um kind of restoration um again i i think we're moving past thinking about what did this look like you know, in 1850, it's more about how are we bringing these native plants to think about the future. And because we have invasive woody pressure that wasn't there even 50 years ago, this prescribed fire regime is really what we have to do to stay on top of it. Uh, we will, if we start seeing woodies pop up in plantings, uh, we may burn that unit two or three years in a row to kind of get on top of that. And we will go out and, and um, um, using, you know, herbicide to on that specific stem uh, kill those woodies as well. But um, in general, we try to maintain a fire regime that's robust enough that the woodies don't get on, get ahead of us. Awesome. Um, this next one is a, a good one that I know you've thought about a lot and it's how do ecologists let go of strict experimental design principles and still em embrace a best practice for science that still works for the landowner? Ah, I love this question. Um, yeah, I think first and foremost, I'm going to say um, just like having a community of volunteers and practitioners at Nichisa has helped create a heterogeneous landscape of different types of plantings and different types of setting. I think it's good and healthy to have different kinds of focuses for, for science and scientific questions. And I when I approach my work, so a big part of my role is to encourage and support scientists to do work at Nuchisa Grasslands. Um, there are some science questions that really require this strict experimental design because they're trying to get at a mechanism. And those kinds of questions are, are honestly not a great fit for the kind of work we're doing at Nuchisa because our number one priority is uh, restoring and conserving this habitat um, that we have. And so I think first and foremost, I would say, I don't feel the need for all science questions to have um, a space specifically at Nichisa, uh, but I absolutely encourage all of those kinds of scientific questions, which include uh, rigorous plantings at, um, you know, experimental gardens or uh, university plots, those sorts of things. These all play a really important role. And um, I certainly look at that work in the literature and help inform my, uh, my and our decisions um, on our broader landscape. Now, that being said, um, when, especially when like a newer scientist that, that I'm engaging with is coming to uh, Nichusa, I really tried to set up that, you know, our main goal is to have a thriving landscape level Pograss Prairie, and we have a lot of questions. There's still a lot of areas we struggle with that. There's not everything we do works well. There's certainly areas of our preserve where we we still struggle to figure out how to how to handle what 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 is there. Um, and we're welcoming to questions around those. Um, around those concerns or collaborations that get there, but also providing that we're doing this work in this management and that sometimes allows for unique scientific questions that can't be addressed in uh, a rigorous plot approach. So um, 
I think kind of coming back to this, like, how do ecologists let go? I think it's a little bit different for each person. I personally love working with graduate students who haven't necessarily formed a real strong opinion about how they have to answer questions correctly so that I can kind of have these broader conversations and encourage encourage a little broader thinking. But I, you know, I can also do that with, with an established scientist um, as well. I'll stop there. I hope that, I hope that kind of struck what, what the question was about. Um, um, it looks like we're running low on questions in the chat. Um, I maybe will give you one more to answer and then we can um, close out unless someone has anything burning in the chat. Um, I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit more about the differences between those never plowed quote unquote native prairies and the the plantings beyond you know you had you showed us some great data of, of how those differ and I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit more about how they might differ in other ways yeah so your how the differences oh amongst the unplowed hilltop prairies yeah really good yeah. question um yes so kind of give some context um and in fact this picture I'm glad I left this up this is the original purchase. This is the original 400 acres. And these hilltops here, you can see, these were never plowed. They were heavily grazed, um, cattle um, in those areas. Um, and then down here in the foreground, this was the agricultural field. And in fact, this is the 1988 planting that we're looking at right here in this photo. So this is fortuitous. Um, this is one of those hilltop um, transects that I talked about. There's also, you know, on the preserve, there's there's other hilltops that they were honestly acquired at different years at different times. Um, they would be further to the north of this photograph and to the east of this photograph. Um, they're hilltops that certainly um, everyone was aware of when the Nuchisa Grasslands project started. There was always a goal that those those hilltops were were priorities for protection and. Over the years, um, we've had the opportunity to, to purchase those for, willingly from landowners. Um, so that's where these are coming from. And that's why they're a little bit um, different. Um, some of them are a little sandier. Some of them are a little gra more gravel. Some of them were heavily grazed. Some of them were lightly grazed. Um, some of them, um, I'm thinking of a few examples that actually weren't in the data I shared with you, but we have a few examples where they were actually overseeded with things uh, like bird's foot trefoil, which is one of our, our worst invasive species now, because they were a forage plant for, for cattle. And so these hilltop remnants just came into Nature Conservancy management in very different conditions. But there's also this underlying that these plant communities have always been a little bit different. And in fact, um, these hilltops here, we have these big, uh, these are native plums, these kind of uh, woody bunches that you're seeing here. Um, this is pretty exciting. We don't get a lot of big native plum thickets in Illinois anymore. And so this is a wonderful resource. We don't have a native plum thicket like this on any of the other uh, remnants. But we have another remnant that has a really big Juneberry thicket. And that's also no other remnant that's got that. <laughs> and there's a remnant over there that's got uh, this cute little uh, blazing star that again, we just don't see that species on the other remnants. So they all kind of have these unique species that make them a little bit different from each other. Even though there's also um, you know, most of them are dominated by little blue stem um, and have a variety of, of um, I'm thinking of creamy baptisia tends to be consistently located on all of these preserves. So there are some commonalities, but there's just these little things that make them enough different. And those might be the result of just the plant communities that evolved on these hilltops because of different parent material. And some of it might be the result of different management prior to, to the Nature Conservancy owning it. Awesome. That was great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay. I am going to get us back into um, these slides. Does it look okay? No, oh, wait, you're not seeing it. Hang on a second. Here we go. Okay. Look okay? Good? Okay, cool. Let me switch. Okay, cool. Okay, so that brings
brings today's AER Live to a close. Thanks again to Elizabeth and everyone who joined us for today's workshop. The research article summarizing some of Elizabeth's work at Natchusa can be found on our, in our journal, Ecological Solution, Solutions and Evidence, where we also have bespoke article types such as practice insights that enable ecological practitioners to easily share their key findings and observations from experience, whether it's a case study, protocol, or a more communicative piece calling for new approaches. If you feel like you or your project collaborators have something to share with the community, especially following today's workshop, please visit um, practice the Practice Insights webpage to find out more. Next month's AER Live will be brought to you by Dr. Oliver Metcalf from Baker Consultants, the ecological consultancy behind the latest UK guidelines on ecoacoustic monitoring. And we'll be joined by Paul Howden Leach from our sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics, who will chair the session. If you haven't already, you can register for this workshop now by visiting our website. And a final thanks again to today's sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics. In addition to creating bioacoustics research tools, they offer free online resources for professionals, including product training, webinars, and more. You can browse their monthly offerings at wildlifeacoustics.com forward slash resources. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see many of you again at our next AER Live. Goodbye.